Good evening, everyone. How's everyone doing? Nope. How's everyone doing? There we go. I'm Rebecca Price with the Nashville Public Library Special Collections Division, which is right upstairs on the second floor and home to two of Nashville's beloved community spaces, the Civil Rights Room and the Votes for Women's Room. I want to welcome everyone to Nashville Public Library for tonight's Conversations at NPL program with rower and community organizer Arshay Cooper, author of A Most Beautiful Thing. This is the moving true story of a group of young men growing up on Chicago's west side who formed the first all-black high school rowing team in the nation, and in doing so, not only transform a sport, but their lives. We are thankful to all of you for joining us here tonight and those watching live on YouTube, and we extend a special thanks to our sponsor this evening, the Nissan Foundation, for making tonight's program and reception possible. Tonight's event marks our second of three thematic programs in the revival of Conversations at NPL, the long-standing humanities-based public program series presented by NPL Special Collections, which aims to stimulate serious public dialogue on all facets of culture, history, and modern society. These, prog <clears throat> These programs broaden the work that Special Collections does upstairs in our exhibit program spaces, the Civil Rights Room and the Votes for Women's Room, where we inspire students of all ages, members of corporations, community-based organizations, and more, with stories of Nashville's rich civil rights history and the fight for women that continue to wage for equitable treatment in this country. We engage them and visitors from all over the world in meaningful conversations about our past and connect the dots to the present to look at why we still seem to be fighting many of the same battles today. Each season, running from summer to summer, we have an annual Conversations at MPL Focus that we'd use to have a deeper dives and conversations into these areas of equity and social justice. The season's focus is sports. And hopefully, folks in the audience were able to attend our first event on Title IX last October and the battle for women's equality in sport. If not, you can find a recording of it on the library's YouTube channel. We hope you will save the date for the third and final program for this season's annual focus on sports, which will be June 13th. It's an evening with Katherine Switzer, who made history in 1967 when she became the first woman to run the Boston Marathon resulting in backlash and women being barred from the marathon until 1972. Her incredible story is one of perseverance and global social change, and because of her, millions of women are now empowered by the simple act of running. Now for just a couple of housekeeping items. Please remember to validate your parking ticket if you parked in the library garage, which will validate up to 90 minutes. Validation machine is located at the main circul circulation desk in the lobby. And please be mindful that we are recording this presentation. Before we begin tonight's program, let us be reminded that we occupy the ancestral and traditional lands of the Cherokee, Shawnee, Choctaw, Chickasaw, and Creek nations. We would like to honor all the ancestors of this land on which we meet today, from the elders who have gone before to the generations to come. Tonight, we are so excited to welcome and spend the evening with Arshay Cooper, a true Renaissance man. He is an athlete, best-selling and award-winning author, a two-time Golden Oar recipient for his contributions to the sport of rowing, a motivational speaker and activist, an AmeriCorps alumni, and a Le Cordon Bleu graduate and former personal chef. Arshay grew up on west side of Chicago in a community surrounded by gangs and drugs. In 1997, he joined and later became captain of the country's first all-black high school rowing team at Manly High School, and an experience that changed his life. Over the years, Arche has founded numerous rowing clubs, programs, and foundations to help youth across the country, and now globally, anywhere, quote, a puddle of water exists, so that other young people can experience the profound change that can happen on the water. We're going to show a, a video uh, to begin this evening's program of Arshay's work. And then after that, I will turn the evening over to my library colleague, Elliot Robinson, our host for the evening.
When I'm on the water, I don't think about anything else. It is my peace. It's a safe place for, for me, personally. Like being away from the drama and chaos that's like back at home. Everything is wild. There's no poverty attached to me. There's no limitations attached to me. It makes you feel like I've arrived. I'm going to the mother city. I'm going to the motherland. The dream is to get people who look like me from Africa all the way to the States to represent us in a sport that was hidden from us for so long. from Chicago all the way to Cape Town, South Africa. There's an equity issue in the sport. The bear is, is cash, it's capital. We feel like we don't belong. They don't have the boats, they don't have the oars. You have a team of 18 kids and only two to three ergs, and those ergs were busted up. I learned these are kids who grew up just like I did. It's where talent was everywhere, but access and opportunity was not. I grew up in a township called Guamashu, which is a township known for crime, drugs, violence. I saw young people's dreams and talents being wasted because they passed away quite young due to gangsterism. That society, it, 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 does, it, it does something to your mindset. There were not a lot of opportunities. I actually thank God for even getting this opportunity. Having Ashe here, and showing our kids where he comes from. It is a very powerful story. You all are talented, you know what I mean? Hopefully when you grow up and do good things, you can go back and take somebody with you. When I saw the first person who looked like me Rowan, I said, gosh, I can do that. That could be me. It's not enough to talk about diversity. There has to be action. And we have drawn six new rowing machines. You know, if we can figure out a way to help them experience everything that rowing can bring, I think we're, we're accomplishing what we need to accomplish here. I think rowing has actually made me realize that there is more to me than the person I am. You almost said, good job. Now that I'm here, my love for the water keeps growing and growing and growing rapidly. That's where I, like, I get to focus on my mental health. O'Shea says, you bury something, you bury it alive. And that's something I, I deal with on a daily basis. And O'Shea is saying, in a rowing boat, you have to look backwards in order to move forward. I can see that I have to somehow deal with it. And the best way to do that is with my team. I think what we're doing is giving them access to heal from that pain, from that trauma, and understand that they are the ones that they have been waiting for. We're not waiting on Superman, we're waiting on ourselves. Now is the hour when we must say goodbye. So you I feel like he's my role model because I feel like I can also do the same for my community. I'm so emotional right now because he's leaving. I really strongly feel this is a revolution. Like the waves, they're going to grow bigger than us. It's going to be bigger than us. And if more people can jump in on the bandwagon, that's how South Africa will move forward. That's the only way. Yeah. Oh, please remember me when you return, you find me waiting here. Wow. That's that's awesome.
<laughs> until we got back into the green room. Um, so, I, well, I guess I, I do want to come, come back to that, but we're going we're gonna to look back before we go forward. Um, there's certainly more than a few of us in this room who have, at some time or another, pledged, you know, I'm, I'm going to write something. You know, for me, it's a play, but I haven't done it yet. But because uh, we know that it's more than just a notion to, to try to write something. So I want to ask, where, where did you get the idea to write the book? And how difficult was it for you to get started? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, thank you all for coming, coming out. Um, you know, I went to Le Cordon Bleu, Le Cordon Bleu, England, came back, became a chef. I was a chef at WWE Wrestling. I was a personal chef, and then I got a job for Warner Brothers as a food stylist, so, you know, working on movie sets. And so I moved to New York, and at that time, you know, I kind of was just like, making money, I was living my best life, I was hanging out all the time, and this, this woman at work said, you look like you have a story to tell. And I was like, what? No, no, I don't got a story to tell. And every day, she would ask me to speak at this school in Harlem. It was called Beginning with Children. And it was an all boys school, six, seven graders, a kid who grew up like I did. And, and every day I was like, no, I'm not speaking in school. I wasn't speaking yet, I didn't want to speak, I didn't want to do that. And, and really, the reason why I said no is because I knew in order to connect with these young boys, I had to talk about what I haven't yet healed from. And so I said no. And, uh, and so really didn't even think about writing or telling my story. And then one day she was like, we just really need you at this school. I volunteer at this school. So I go to this school and I see all these young men that remind me of my friends. I rode with Preston, Alvin, Malcolm, and Pookie. And Pookie G. Yeah, Pookie G. <laughs> and uh, I tell my story, and they were so in it. And at the end of that, I, I ask everyone, what's their dreams? And so people start spitting out these lofty dreams, like NBA player, NFL player, actor, astronaut. Yeah. And there was only one kid that raised his hand. And he was sitting in the back. And I said, what's your dream? And he said, my dream is to eat at Chipotle. And everyone starts laughing. And while they were laughing, he kind of just sunk in his seat. Mm. And that look was so familiar, you know? Mm. And so after speaking, I go up to the school counselor and I said, here's $20. We have to make sure that kid eats at Chipotle. And he said, no, 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 you did enough. You did enough. I was like, you don't understand. If we can eliminate the small dream, there's room for more dreams. There's room for bigger dreams. Because my only dream as a kid was to go downtown Chicago. Four miles away and never been, I started rowing. I go downtown Chicago. I'm like, oh gosh, like I had to go out of town. You know what I mean? And, and my dreams just got bigger. And so I go home that night and I couldn't stop thinking about this kid. And I couldn't stop thinking about the sport that changed my life. It just, you know. Um, and so, you know, the next morning I, I called the young, the young lady and I said, I will go back every Friday to spend time with that yeah. school and those boys. And then from there, I started an indoor rowing program. And it started reminding me of my friends again. And that's when I decided that like, I can make an impact on these young people's lives, but so many others. And so I decided that I was going to write. And um, I started writing. Didn't know much about writing. I, I but read a lot of books. And uh, I remember locking myself in the room for a week and watching all these YouTube videos. Uh, on how to write a memoir and all these workshops <laughs> from like Joan Didion and James Baldwin yeah. and Liz Gibbard and all, all these different amazing writers and, and started writing. And it was hard because after I started writing the book, I pitched the book to eight different editors and they all said, no, you wasn't a writer. You guys didn't win a national championship, no. Uh, where are the guys at now? Well, some of them dealing with this. Uh, they're not even successful, no, all no's. And, um, you know, and so, you know, I was like, okay, like Rowan teaches you to go after and take risk. And so I self-published a book and, um, and sold a lot of books, I hustled, hustled, mm -hmm. sold a lot of books and it got the attention of a filmmaker and then all the big publishing houses came after. It was like, we love this story. And uh, I published a book with Macmillan. People read it all over the world and uh, those editors who, who said no, all, all following me on Twitter once it became like, <laughs> Start winning all these amazing awards, but uh, yeah, that was kind of the process. Yeah, yeah. So, so you didn't have 
it seems like I would think, you know, this is this is your own life. So the story must have already just been laid all the way out, all the way to the end. Like you like you knew what you exactly what you were going to write, but it probably wasn't like that, was it? No, it wasn't like that. You know, it it, it you know, if you lost somebody or um, had a breakup um, or been hurt, you say to yourself that I never want to relive those things again. Writing this book. I had to relive all of those things again. That was very hard for me. Um, have conversation with my mother about what it was like being her and, and, and having conversation with my grandmother who moved to the South because you know uh, it was violent and, and reflect on friends that we lost and had to think about what it was like to skip over pools of blood, to hear gunshots when you slap and all those different things. And also be in a boathouse where you know, that felt like, that I shared with three private schools and it felt like an away game for me every time I st stepped foot in there. So it was, it was a long process, you know, and, but at the same time, it was, it was healing for me. Um, and so that um, was a huge part of the, the writing process. But the closer you get to your pain, the, the more people you connect with because, you know, we are more alike than we are unalike and all have suffered loss in some way. So you're talk, talking about the environment where, where you grew up. Um, talk a little bit more about that and how unlikely a place, you know, that Manly High was for this idea to even come to be, you know, much less to take hold and grow. Yeah, you know, it's, um, you know, it is a place where, like I said, it's a lot of talent, but not a lot of access and opportunity. You know, there's a part in the film that Pookie, no, Pooh, Pooh said, when they tore down the YMCA, we ran to the streets. Like, there's only one YMCA, 200 kids, that's where the coaches were, the school counselors, the mentors, the place lose funding, and there's 200 kids with nothing to do. I don't care where you're from, the color of your skin, um, if 200 kids are hanging out every day with nothing to do, crazy stuff happens, right? You start, yeah. you know, trying to figure things out, and, and, uh, and, and that's what we saw a lot in, in, in our neighborhoods, but when, when rowing came, Pooh ran to the rowing team, right? When opportunity came, and yeah, it, it, was, it was a very neglected community. I don't remember opening a new book ever in high school. And you know, a lot of the structural limitations destroyed the unity that our grandparents once had in, 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 in that community. Um, but you know, we uh, definitely was in search for something, something new, uh, especially me, and, and, uh, and then I remember you know, the start of something great for me is when I saw that boat in the lunchroom. <laughs> here's, here's a boat, and it, it was an eight, eight boat? No, it was not an eight. <laughs> I was gonna say, that's pretty big. <laughs> no, it was not an eight. It was, um, it was, it was a double. Okay. And um, it was this beautiful white boat, and I remember just walking in the lunchroom, I was like, what the heck is that? I never even seen a boat yeah. up close. And at my school, you know, there was all black students, and pretty much all black teachers at that school. And I remember like staring at this boat and this little white lady tapped my shoulders. And I was like, what's up? And she was like, you wanna join the crew team? And I was like, crew, like you know, we're taught. If someone asks you to join their crew, run the other way as fast as you can. So I was confused like, <laughs> and there was already so many gangs and crews. I'm like, now this white lady starting a crew in my school? Like, <laughs> what, what, like, what, like what's happening here, you know? And, um, and she says, well, let me show you. And behind the boat was this TV monitor, and they were showing the Olympic Games. And the way these guys were moving this boat looked so magical. And it looked like an opportunity. But because no one on the screen looked like me or reflect the world I was used to, I said no to the opportunity, and I walked away. And, um, and no one signed up. And then the next day, I walk in the lunchroom, the boat is still there, and there's a long line of people signing up. And I said, well, like, what's happening? And it says, you sign up, you get free Chicago pizza, you know? And so everyone's like a sucker for gotcha. Chicago pizza. You know what I mean? And, <laughs> and, uh, and um, yeah, that kind of had us from there. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> so now you got a group of boys from the west side of Chicago, they're taking up rowing. And you get in the boat and you have uh, different affiliations represented, different, different, you know, gangs represented. What, what, was, what was that like to try to make a team out of that? Yeah, that was, that was rough. You know, I, I didn't know how, I mean, I knew, like, 
like I said to myself, like, this is crazy. Like, these guys hate each other. And they're all in the same room. And these guys are, you know, sons of drug dealers, sons of drug addicts in different, you know, for different communities. And first of all, like, if we're going to be racing, like, you know, sons of accountants and, you know, and sons of doctors, like, right. that was going to be right. interesting to me. And, and I was trying to figure out how this is going to work. But I think what connect to me, because all these coaches explain how amazing this sport is and how great the sport would be. And I remember saying to myself, okay, all right, there, there be, there's going to be no cheerleaders, all right? There's like <laughs> no busload of fans. Mm. There's no million dollar contracts at the college. Like, why am I, why am I going to do this? But the more I thought about it, what made sense and what I loved about it is what you will find is a group of people with no agenda, doesn't care about the busload of fans, doesn't care about the ESPN player of the week, doesn't care about the million dollar contracts, but will show up every single day to rip apart their hands and break their backs for themselves and the person who sits in front of them and the person who sits behind them. And I was like, I only had one friend. I was like, that's the kind of friend I need in my life. Those are the kind of people I want to be around. And that is what caught my attention. And I think the second thing was like, you race once, maybe once in your city, and every other race was outside of your city. Like, I've never been anywhere, right? And so to be able to explore and see other things, and, um, and I was scared of the water, I didn't know how to swim, so wow, like, that's gonna um, solve this, this safety issue, right? And one thing that uh, Coach said was like, you know, do it afraid, because every time you conquer a fear, life gets a lot less scary, you know? And, and so I was like, okay, you know, I learned how to swim, I can enjoy going to the beach and, and stuff like that. And I think we all had that kind of same mentality, uh, and we decided we was gonna, you know, try it together. Was, was that the first time that you had really committed to something like that and dedicated yourself, you know, especially in a team kind of concept? And what was that? And what was that like too? Because I, I know I can imagine some of those uh, spring semester days in Chicago. It might be a little chilly trying to get out there on that water, <laughs> but uh, but you all did it anyway. You know, so to, to, to some of that commitment. You know, what does what does it take to make sure you get out there every day? You know, it, it was number one the power of the the water. I was in the dean's office one day and I was very upset. Didn't do any schoolwork, and he said to me, "You need sports." And so he sent me out, sent me out to play, try out for football. And I love football. I love everything about football. I still love football. And I remember catching the ball at, you know, at the trouts. And the coach said, knock him dead. And everyone starts running towards me. And I was like, oh, my God, you know. <laughs> and, and I was like, I don't want to be knocked dead, you know. And, and it. And it's not like this for everyone. Like football changed so many people's lives, but for me, it triggered the trauma. Like I wanted to fight, mm. you know, because I've been chased, right? I heard gunshots when I slept, right? You know, people been roughed up, uh, and, and, and that impact, yeah. you know, triggered the trauma. So it didn't make me feel good. So I was like, I'm not playing football. And then Mr. LaFleur said, try basketball. So I go to basketball tryouts. If you're not good, people will tell you you're not, you're not, you're not, you suck, you're garbage, you're not great, like trash talk you. And that's, those were the kind of words I heard from people I love. You suck, you're not going to be good. And so that triggered trauma and I wanted to fight. And I was like, I'm done with sports. Uh, but what was different about the water was that when I was, when we were pushed out there into open water and began to develop this magical rhythm pair by pair, um, the same survival mode that told us if you hear a gunshot run said in order to get back to the dock safely, you have to pull for each other. Mm -hmm. And coach is saying, sit tall, breathe, you belong here. And then to go from seeing dirt and concrete every day to water and grass changed everything. And so I'm downloading this serenity. And before it becomes a sport of, of competitiveness, it's a sport of meditation. And the teachers would say to us, if you act up, you're a walking storm. And I'm like, wow, like, this is the first sport that comes to storms in me. And so it's non-combative, it's non-conflict. 
And it was the first sport to actually reduce the trauma. Mm. And so it was not an introduction to sports, it was an introduction to wellness. Mm. And a lot of young people didn't feel well because you know, you know, they, you know, they, they didn't do well because they didn't feel well. Yeah. And so Rowan really put us in the zone and, um, and, and, and it had changed our mindsets, our lives. It felt well, it felt good, it felt powerful, it was empowering. And, um, and, and I think that's when I fell in love with the sport of rowing, that, that peace that I felt out there. And, uh, and we all connected because of that. The water, um, the river, the water out there resonated with the water in us. And we felt one. And um, yeah, it was, it was magical. The boatmen. That, that's, that's powerful to think, you know, when you consider uh, a lot of the relationship that a lot of black people have with the water. Mm -hmm. You know, for you guys to get out there that, that, and, and to do that is, uh, I think it's very brave. I, I was telling you earlier, I could probably do it. You know, I don't swim well, I'd have to have some flippers and then probably wouldn't fit in the boat. <laughs> uh, so we'll, we'll try something else. But, um, but along with the, uh, the, you know, the transformation of your body and, and, and diet and things like that, they're overarching the whole thing, it was, it was a greater mission. Yeah. Tell, tell us about the greater mission of the book. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I was tell I was telling him back. He's like, "How do you know? Like y your body was transformed. Like, how do you know you was in shape?" I was like, "Yeah, because the guys who used to always chase me and catch me, they couldn't catch me anymore." <laughs> I was like, "Yes, this rowing thing is really working out. Like, you should try it." Um, you know. <laughs> uh, yeah, it, yeah. You know, I think the the thing about rowing too is like, just you know, I wasn't the the tallest person on the team, I wasn't the strongest, I wasn't the most talented, but I had the best erg scores. And, and that was because I spent more time on this machine than everyone else. Like I fell in love with this machine and, and, and I wanted to master it. And while everyone was hanging out, I was working and I was better and I won every erg competition in Chicago that I've done. Mm. And, and, and I was like, wow, like I can use the same you know, philosophy in the classroom. I was a D student before I started rowing. But I was like, okay, I'm not the smartest, I'm not the most gifted or the best test taker, but if I can just outwork everyone, you know, when everyone's hanging out, I was working. When people went to the mall, I was studying. Before class, after class, and I became an A student, a very well-rounded person. And so rowing was like, like teaching me that. And, and, and in a, a large part of it, you know, um, was now, because on every team, on every team, it doesn't matter if it's in sports or if it's at work, there's always one person that wants it a little bit more than everybody else. Mm. You know, it was MJ, it was Kobe and his team, right? And for the most part, we all know who that person is. And sometimes there are athletes who are very content with being that person. But when that person can get everybody else to want it just as much as they do, then you're living in your championship rounds, right? Understanding each individual, what they bring to the table, where their strengths are, where their weaknesses are, study them and help them to want it and, and, and get them to be, I mean, well, get them to have that same drive. And that is what I had to do. And then when we all worked together to do that, we, we became better. And, and that's, so talk about how you became the captain of, of the team. Yeah, yeah, I was, yeah, that was cool to be, become captain. Uh, you know, the most powerful moment of being a captain, you talk about Eugene. Um, Eugene was this guy who, who worked for Parks, but he was, you know, charged of Boathouse facility. And he would always drop knowledge on us, right? But one of the things um, he said, like, I became captain. I felt like, yeah, I'm, like, I'm the captain, I'm the man, you know? And I remember one day walking in the Boathouse and there was an oar and some towels, and there was so many things on the floor. And I remember stepping over it. And he said, come here. He said, why did you step over the mess? And I was like, because uh, you know, I, I didn't make the mess. Mm. You know? And he was like, well, you know, there's this in Lincoln Park Boathouse. It's just leave the Boathouse better than you found it. And he said, you got to leave the Boathouse better than you found it, even if you didn't make the mess. And I was like, well, how does that teach the next person responsibility if I have to clean up their mess. And he was like, why do you think we say that? And you know, we shared a boat house with three other schools. And I said, I guess it makes it easier for the next group if we clean up the mess. And he looked at me and he said, one day you'll understand. And I was like, 
simple. Like, okay, you're saying leave the boat house better than you found it, even if we didn't make the mess, because it makes it easier for the next group. Like, that's it. And he said, one day you'll get it. And I remember going to the boat house the next day. He said, what's the rule? And I said, leave the boat house better than you found it, even if you didn't make the mess, because it makes it easier for the next group. And he said, you'll get it one day. And I didn't, I, I, I couldn't quite understand what he was saying. And he knew, and like, he was always challenging me to be this leader. But it wasn't until months. I remember sitting with Alvin and the team. I remember being in the lunchroom. And Alvin, my mom was a drug addict and she recovered and got a job and did very well. And I remember sitting next to Alvin and he was suffering because his mom was a drug addict. And I knew it. And I just stepped over it. I knew the place that can change his mom, but I said nothing because I felt like it wasn't my business. It wasn't my mess. Joshua, who was in and out trying to figure out who he was, like people clowned him. He was a clown and they messed with him. And I knew the people who would bully him and talk about him all the time, but I felt like it wasn't business, so I stepped over it. And so every day I felt like I was stepping over these things that, you know, but I can just pretty much change. And I think what Eugene was saying, you know, even in the world we live in today, we say to ourselves, well, we have nothing to do with what happens with the black community or cops. So we have nothing to do with um, kids over there who can't afford to row or what happened in the South many years ago. It has nothing to do with me. What Eugene was saying is that if we can just leave the boathouse, our schools, our cities, our country, our communities better than we found it, even if we didn't make the mess, it makes it easier for the next generation. Mm -hmm. and, and, and that really helped me to be the captain. And that's when you saw in the film, for those who read the film, read the book, I started showing up at Alvin's house every single day. Now that is powerful. Uh, that's, that's a true homie. That's somebody that's really down with you. Somebody's gonna come to your house every day to make sure that you guys get to school on time, and, and you, I, I wake up and you're standing over me, man. That's 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 dedication to to the team and to the friends. Um, I, I want to hear you talk a little bit about Ken. Uh, Ken was the the one who brought the idea. He said Manly was about the seventh or eighth school that he had approached, yeah, yeah. and uh, I finally got it in. Yeah, he's a good dude, man. He um, he is a good dude. Um, he had this idea, we're gonna start this team on the west side of Chicago. He went to eight schools and they all said, no, our kids won't do it. It won't work it's for the elite, you know? And, um, and he came to our school, he started this program. And he was funny because this dude was like, you know, he's this white dude he's, and, and he just showed up at our house and he was walking in our doors. And we're like, dude, you can't do that. You know what I mean? Not over here on the west side. Um, but, you know, I think what was, special about him is that he understood that, uh, first of all, that rowers measure success by gold medals and what university you're going to go to, what national team you're on. But our community, if you think about the editors who said no to my book, the, our community measures success in, in those ways, but in different ways as well. You know, um, you know, I think about, you know, Ken first brought in his team. There was men who looked like me that was coaches that really helped me to make that decision. Like, oh, I want to do this. And then there was Coach Jessica. Like, women wasn't really coaching men at that time, but most of us was raised by women. And I felt comfortable with women. So having Coach Jessica there, like, the whole leadership team kind of reflect the whole city of Chicago, you know? And he brought in this amazing team, but understood, and, and we all understood that, you know, Learning how to swim is a win, right? Being committed to something as a win. Taking a bus an hour and a half a day downtown to row was a win. Guys, who Chicago's problems that Chicago have been trying to solve for so long, how do we get these guys from different neighborhoods to become a brotherhood? Like, rowing accomplished that, that was a win. And so that's why I wrote the book. I want to put these wins out there. So he really helped us to understand what the wins are. And we were able to really have success by the way we measure success. 
as well. And, um, and, and that's what I loved about him. You know what I mean? He, he, he studied. He did his homework. He didn't just come here and say, I'm going to save these kids, right? He showed up at the house. He's like, I got to meet their dad and their mom, right? And, 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 uh, and, and, and hopefully they w- will sign off on this, this connection, this relationship that, we, that we're about to build. Nice. So uh, you get to the point of the first actual race. I want to hear about the first race. <laughs> that, the, that the Manly crew had. Yeah. So the first race, if you haven't read the book, you know, we go out there and uh, how many rowers are in a row? Well, oh, wow. It's oh. a lot of rowers. Oh, wow. So our program, honestly, we were, we were Ken, they were building the airplane in the air, right? It was all kind of mistakes, but it was the best airplane I've been on. And, um, but they didn't tell us, like, anything about like, how a regatta will run, what it's like. And they just said, you guys are gonna race at the Chicago Sprints. And we, we didn't know what to expect. And in our community, whenever there's festivals and community events, there'll be these tents. And in these tents, there's um, like the taste of Chicago, like all this free food that you can taste and it's yours. So we go to this regatta and we see all these tents. And we're like, oh gosh, look at like all this food. And so we start a group of like, dude, it was like 20, like just start running through tents eating food. And all these people were looking at us like, you know, they didn't, no one said no. They probably thought these kids are hungry or like, you know, and so we was like, let's go to the next tent. So first of all, we spent like the first 45 minutes just running through people with tents, <laughs> eating their food. <laughs> and uh, and uh, but people were so welcoming. And then um, we ra- we, we're about to start to race. And I remember... Malcolm, this guy had a recorder and he was interviewing Malcolm. And Malcolm was like, it's like Jackie Robinson going into baseball. You yeah, know, it's like yeah. Jesse Owens going into running. <laughs> you know, we're gonna dominate, we're gonna dominate. And I'm sitting there like, dude, like, we need to have a lot of practice. <laughs> so we get to the start line, we start rowing, the port side was way too strong, we run into a brick wall. <laughs> Boom. And I was like, gosh. We push off, we start rowing again, and we run to the run to a brick wall the second time. It was so bad, barely made it down the course. And uh, I remember we get, getting out of the I was so upset, but I remember Alvin, because Alvin was the funny guy telling Malcolm, I guess it was more like Jordan going into baseball. And then the other guy's like, it was more like Shaq going into movies, right? Like we just started, you know, making fun of each other. But I, I, I was, and I remember running into the locker room, I was so embarrassed, and then Eugene came. And he said, who said it was going to be easy? Uh, and I was like, like, I, like, I'm done. I was ready to be done with it. You know, I was just like, this, this, it didn't work out. And um, he said, what he said was, he said, many years from now, you know, I, people are not going to remember those other guys, but they will remember you. You have to keep growing. Like, this is something special. And it reminds me of that Bruce Lee quote that says, um, for those who have lost, he said, in greater attempts, even failure is glorious. Mm-hmm. Like, you guys are part of the hardest sport in doing something that a lot of people are afraid of. And to be on that earth, the amount of time, how early you got to get up, the amount of time you have to row and get out there and clean up geese poop and all that stuff, like, you know, and, and, and that spoke to me. And because of that, you know, we, I, I stuck with the sport. Wow. So if Eugene hadn't been there that day, it, it could have been all over. Uh, back to before eating it ice even cream and cheeseburgers. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I think there was something, there's something really powerful about you being the one in there to, to hear that message from Eugene yeah. to, in order to keep this thing going and, and to spread that message throughout the team. I think, that's, I think that was some kind of divine intervention. No, the burning bush. Eugene, yeah. Eugene was your burning bush. No burning bush. <laughs> <laughs> um, but... but uh, Aside from the, the rowing, talk talk a little more about some of the uh, some of the other exposure. You know, as far as travel and uh, and some of the other things that Ken was trying to push, as far as you know the, the entrepreneurship and things like that, and where and where that went for guys. Yeah, it was just not a rowing program. It was an entrepreneurship program. So once a week, you know, um, we had entrepreneurship class for for three years. He was taking entrepreneurship class, and we were starting our business and we learned how to network and how to take risk and we learned about revenue, what the community needed, what was missing in the community. Um, that was a very big part of it. Um, and um, 
I would say this move, you know, just skipping past a lot of things. 90% of the guys who were on my rowing team who took those entrepreneurship classes own their business in Chicago, which is awesome. Yeah. Uh, that was very much a part of the culture, yeah. the same as rowing, but it's taught us so much. And for me, before I, I became, he, we did a lot of like planning and goal setting, and we talked through a lot of things. And, um, and that's why we have seen that success, right? And, and um, you know, you think about, like, I knew I wanted to go to Le Cordon Bleu, but I knew I wanted to go to Le Cordon Bleu, England. So I started off in Le Cordon Bleu, Chicago, but I sat with Kenny, he's like, what's the plan? And so we figured, I was like, I have to, how do I get there? I don't have the money, what do I do? And so we talked about it. And so basically what I did was I um, started working at Starbucks in the most wealthiest neighborhood in the city of Chicago. Hmm. And that's where the NBA players were going in, the, the, the aldermen, all these folks, right? The dentist, the doctor, and people want their coffee. So I started building relationships with them every morning from 5 a.m. to 9 a.m. And then I would go to school. Now, school schedules like 10 to 4 every single day. And then I would go back and work at Starbucks. And, and then I would do my homework late at night. And I was like, it's not enough. Like, it's not enough. And Kim was like, yeah, this is where you're going to build your relationships. And I was like, all right, I think I need to find a restaurant. And so we found this restaurant called Blackbird in Chicago. They just won the James Beard Award, best restaurant in Chicago. So I show up there and it's like, hey, can I work for free on the weekends? And he was like, yeah, you're probably cutting mushrooms. I was like, I don't care, I wanna work for free. And so after six months of building relationships with all these people at school and learning how to cook and all these people at Starbucks who I was giving coffee to and I learned a lot about their families, I made these business cards um, called catering to families, couples and things like that. And so I started putting all the cars in the sleeves of every Starbucks cup that everyone was coming through. <laughs> and they was like, you, you cook? You cater? I said, yeah, I go to Le Cordon Bleu. They was like, are you good? I was like, yeah, I work at Blackbird. They was like, you work at Blackbird? <laughs> I didn't tell them I was cutting onions and mushrooms and I was working for free. I was like, yeah, I work at Blackbird. And so I started making all this money and I, and I hired like five kids from school and I was paying them like $10 an hour and I was making like $1,500 <laughs> an event. And then I go to Lon Le Cordon Bleu, England. And that's how I came back and started working with WWE Wrestling. But that story landed me my first job with WWE. And, uh, but those were the things that we learned in entrepreneurship, you know, and I'm so glad it was, it's not just rowing, but yeah. education, academics, entrepreneurship, um, all that stuff is important. Exposure, most definitely. I want to ask just a little bit about the relationships with, with some of the guys. Um, you said in the book that one of the first things you are taught is trust no one. I'm not sure how you undo that, but I'm willing to try. How difficult was it and how long did it take for you to be able to have those open exchanges with your teammates for you guys to actually open up to each other and express those open and honest feelings? And then when did it, I guess, transform into more of a brotherhood? Yeah, it was, um, it took a while. I mean, the coach was very intentional about getting to know each other, um, but it was the isolation being the only ones out there that look like us. Those long van rides where the coaches would ask us questions like, what keeps you up at night? What keeps you going? And, um, you know, I think that, you know, that helped us to connect, you know, the isolation, uh, being away from what's happening in our neighborhoods or what's happening in the community uh, where we rode. You think about soldiers who fought in combat many Black and white, right? And they got away from all the American BS and they fought together and became a brotherhood. They had a mission, right? And for us, being away from all those things and it, you know, it's just us out there, we were like, okay, I gotta go to the restaurant, you gotta walk with me, right? And then that's when the conversation started, these guys from different neighborhoods. And, um, you know, and that's when we really started to connect, just being away and then in another city and, you know, being afraid of being away from home, but this is who we know, that helped us to um, connect, you know? And, and rowing, you learn that you cannot do the work of eight, but if eight can do the work of one, we get the job done faster. Mm -hmm. and, um, and, and we learned that lesson by being out there in the boat and being alone, and, um, and, and that is what helped us to connect. 
And, and so then the reward for that vulnerability is that what builds those lifelong bonds? Is, yeah. is the, the, the long-term yeah. relationship? Yeah, absolutely. That, that is what helped. And, and, and I think it was even harder for us to trust the adults, right, and the teachers. But it, there's so many lessons in rowing. Like, you understand that, you know, I think the number one lesson for me was the lesson of the coxswain. Any coxswains in, in the house? <laughs> the lesson of the coxswain was so important for us to be who we ought to be because we didn't really, it was, we learned to trust the guys because that's who we with all the time, but learning to trust like a coach or teacher or even for some people, their parents was, was, was very hard and difficult. But uh, in rowing, when you look at the coxswain, the coxswain is in front of the boat and the biggest complaint towards the coxswain is you don't know what it's like to be us. Right, um, you know, you don't, you're not doing the work. You don't understand. You don't get it. You know what I mean? Like we're out here pulling. You're just screaming, right? Yeah, yeah. Like that was like <laughs> the complaint towards the coxswain, and and but what people don't know is like, you know, when you go to somewhere like the Charles, the coxswain really has to study the course. Mm. Um, the coxswain has while you're hanging out relaxing, the coxswain has to go get up early and go to these meetings, right? The coxswain sees what we don't see. And their job is to make sure we don't hit a brick wall and we get to the other side as safe as possible. But it took a while until I really started learning. Like, I'm always asking myself, what is rowing trying to teach me? What is this trying to teach me? And that lesson taught me that my grandmother, my mother, my coach, my mentor, my teacher, is that, you know, I may say to them, you don't know what it's like to be young. You don't get it. You don't understand. You're always trying to tell me I got to do this or do that. But really, our parents, our coaches, our mentors, they see what we don't see. And, and their job is really is to make sure that we get to the other side as safe as possible. And, and, and they have been here. They've done the work. They studied the course. And until I was able to trust the coxswain, my coaches, my mentor, my parents, I was able to get to that finish line. And that was like the number one lesson I, I've learned from rowing and, and, and from trust. So the coxswain says more than stroke, stroke, stroke. Yeah, yeah, it's a lot more than that. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so um, so, so look, looking at now, how, how often do you get on the water now? Do you still get out there or do you just stay at home? Man, and I do just the had earth? a big burger today. No, um, you know, what, the, you know I, I have a single, I haven't been in my single in a while. But most of the time, I spend a lot of my time traveling um, and working with kids. And most of the time, I'm out there with the high school kids. So I get in a boat when I'm visiting the city and hanging out with high school kids. So that's, that's when I'm out there, usually. OK. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so speaking of the high school kids, how, what is it that drives you to keep encouraging and trying to you know, develop and build this next generation of rowers? Yeah, you know, it's, um, it's um, it's them, right? It, it's, it's, it's what I am seeing. Um, sometimes it's, it's busy. I'm in Africa. I'm in the Bahamas. We're starting teams everywhere. And sometimes my cup is empty. But every time I show up, it's being filled. I, I got a call from this guy who's a librarian in Alliance, Ohio. And he said, hey, we just read your book. 300 kids read your book. 300 kids watch your film. You need to come here ASAP. They want to hear from you. And I was like, that's not how it works. You know what I mean? Um, he was like, you have to get here. And he said, like, can you get here in two weeks? Wow. And so I was like, gosh, OK. So I was like, yeah, I'll go. And so I'm thinking, like, man, these kids must grow up like I did. They must hit it hard, but they love the book. And so I was like, I don't even know where Alliance Ohio is at. And so um, you have to fly into Pittsburgh. And then you have to drive an hour half into Ohio. So I fly to Pittsburgh, and I pick up my friend Matt Lowe. You know Matt Lowe. And I was like, you got to drive me to this place. I haven't even been here. And so we drive an hour and a half into Alliance, Ohio. Five minutes left on the GPS, and there's Confederate flags everywhere. And I was like, where am I? I'll take my chances on the west side of Chicago. No, but I was like, where am I? And I walk into this school. And I see all 300 kids. And there's not a person who looks like me. There's not a person that's brown. And when I walked down the aisle of the auditorium, these kids were screaming and clapping like I was LeBron James. <laughs> I go up to the front. 
And this girl, she was the class president. She stood up and she said, we all have read your book and watched your film. And we want to thank you because we have all unlearned everything our parents taught us about people who look like you. Mm. And that is when I knew I was making an impact. Wow. And, and that filled my cup, right? And so what's keeping me going is, is the young people and, 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 and seeing how they get up every morning and they're grinding and they're rowing. And, and, uh, and I know what this sport can do for anybody, no matter who you are, the God of your prayers, the hand that you hold. Like, I know what this sport can do. I know what the water can do. And, and uh, you know, it's, uh, and it keeps me going. That's you guys. That's all the yeah, guys that yeah, raised your hands yeah. out here. <laughs> He's talking about you. Awesome. Um, so so, what, so how, did, how did the movie even happen? Uh, yeah, you know, I got a call from this lady, Mary Mazio, who's a film director. She's done a lot of great films. And, um, you know, she called me up and said, hey, I, you know, I read the book. I would love to do something with you. And, and I was like, of course, but you have to come to Chicago to learn a little bit about our city before we can do that. And she was awesome. And she was said, yeah, you know, I'm friends with Grant Hill and Dwayne Wade and, you know, and, and I think we can put something special together. I was like, heck yeah. <laughs> and, um, and she said to me, um, who do you want to narrate, Morgan Freeman? I was like, no, I don't want Morgan Freeman. I, I love Morgan Freeman, but I love this guy named Common. So we got, you know, Common's a Chicago guy, you know? And so Common came on board, and then the Winklevoss twin came on board, and everyone just gathered around this story. And, um, and it, was, it was an amazing process, and uh, we learned so much from the moms, the coaches, and, uh, and the film made such a big impact in the world. It won a lot of awards. If you haven't watched the documentary, watch it. And the book also won a ton of awards. I mean, I grew up watching the NAACP Image Awards. Like, that was one of my favorite award shows. And I remember getting a call that says, hey, uh, you're nominated for Best Memoir, Inspirational Memoir, for the NAACP Image Awards. And I was like, wow. And I remember calling my grandmother. I said, Grandma, you can't believe like I'm nominated for the NAACP Image Award. And she's very spiritual. She's a woman of faith. And she said, you know you're going to win, right? You, just get, you know you're going to win. And I was like, yeah, I know I'm going to win. And she said, well, tell me, baby, who are you nominated against? It's 2020. I was like, uh, Obama, A Promised Land. Malcolm Gladwell, and she said, well, you just better be happy that you nominated, baby. And I was like, what? <laughs> and I was like, come on, come on, grandma, ma. Uh, but yeah, but well, so many blessings, you know, from, from that process. Most definitely, for you and for everybody you're yeah. touching, man. Yeah. And, and this is fantastic. Um, so so, so, so what, what's next for these young people, man? And when you talk about the commitment that they need to have you know, my body, mind, and spirit, I'd imagine, right? Yeah, um, I'm sure there's some them? spring racing coming up soon. Um, I, yeah, so you ready? All right, it's, it's two things I, I think I'll leave with the young people, um, everyone in here, is uh, I would say, number one, don't punch yourself in a fist fight. You know what I mean? You, you ever mm. seen someone punch themselves in a fist fight? Imagine me and you okay. about to fight, and I just start punching myself, I won't even be able to perform because of the harm I placed on myself. We, we don't do it physically, but we do it with our words. We do it mentally. Before any race, we said, I'm not, there's no way, you know what I mean? And uh, I'm not gonna win. They're, they're better, they're stronger. We're just a club team. We're, we're, you know, they won this championship. And before we can even get in the boat, we are exhausted because of the mental harm we placed on ourselves. At the same time, if I come show up every day and I tell you, you know what, you're, you're, you're not going to PR, you're, you're never going to win a race, you're not going to be on a national team, you're, you're not going to pass your grades, you're not going to get the job that you apply for, you're not going to get to the intern, the intern job that you want, the internship. If I tell you that every day at some point you're not going to like me, the truth is, is that we will tell ourselves that more than anybody ever would. Have you ever told yourself I'm not going to PR? There's no way I'm going to win that race. I'm not going to pass that test, right? And if we do it so much, it's going to come to a point where we're not going to like the sport. We're not going to like the school. We're not going to even like ourselves. And that's what I was doing to myself. And I had to undo that. I had to speak life 
I have to trust my dopeness. I have to trust the work that I put in. You have to believe in yourself, right? And so that confidence comes from the work that you put in. If we were all on the airplane and the plane was going down, and I said to you guys, I have all the confidence in the world that I can fly this plane, you're going to say, dude, like, you don't know how to fly a plane. But if you knew that I put hours of work into being a pilot, you would say, Arshay, go, right? That confidence that the coach will have in you and you have in yourself about the hours you spend in your studies in, in that machine or working on your mental piece in the books that you read, that's where the confidence comes from. So really continue to speak life, put in the work, and that confidence will come. Cool. Awesome. How about that, huh? I think it's time for Q&A. <laughs> R.J. Cooper. My sweetie's in the front row. I think I'm going to sell her on the, buying an erg for the house. We, we need to get an erg in the house. <laughs> <laughs> Are we taking some questions? Yes, we're going to open this up to questions now. Thank you so much, R.J. Um, we have time for just a couple of questions from the audience, but first we did have some kind of pre-questions um, that came in, and a lot of them all had to kind of do with, what are you doing now, after the book, after the movie, what are you working on now, um, what can people get inspired now, what's the work like now? Yeah, yeah, we, um, um, so many different things, we launched the Most Beautiful Thing Inclusion Fund, um, and we are starting, like what we do in South Africa, we're doing all over the country, uh, we find programs, we accelerate them, we give them new ergs, new boats, uh, we give them money towards swimming, towards transportation, academic support, ACT prep, college readiness, uh, and out-of-town regattas. Like, we help programs get fast, we solve the equity issue in the sport, and, um, and, so, and, and that's going really well. Um, we are working on a deal with Netflix right now for a feature film based on the book, which is awesome. So we just found a writer, so we, we, we're in that process. Um, this guy's gonna play Eugene. <laughs> He's an actor. <laughs> um, and um, yeah, and just, you know, I, I'm writing, I'm speaking, and you know, there's many things, but there's so many things going up, but if you're like on LinkedIn or Instagram, please follow be in con contact with me, and we always posting what's next, and we always looking for volunteers, young people, and uh, uh, especially in the summertime. Uh, I assume Common will play you. <laughs> <laughs> you know, when, when I'm, I have to say this: like when you're black, you always have to say, "I want Denzel to play me." Well, you know, uh, like Den it's not gonna happen, but like I, I'm still gonna say Denzel. <laughs> Yeah, even if it's 15 years old, like I want Denzel, you know, I want Denzel. <laughs> uh, do we have any questions from the audience? Yes, that will come. Yeah. Um, thank you so much, Arche. Your words are really resonant with me. Um, you mentioned earlier kind of encouraging your team to buy in to what you were doing. Was there anything in particular that you said to them, like getting an extra volume or just like having a different attitude that really like transformed your crew? Yeah, that's, that's, that's a good question. Um, for buy-in, you know, uh, quick question. So everyone in the room, think about your favorite coach. Think about your favorite coach. And what is the number, in one word, in one word, what was the number one thing you learned from your coach? In one word. i ask you first. Discipline. Someone else tell me. Commitment. Support. Perseverance. Dedication. Pride. Couple more. Mindset. Attitude. Trust. Love that. Um, so you guys spent hours and hours and hours in, on just beating on your craft, rowing, hours and hours, and no one said feathering. No one said rigging. No one said erging. No one said to drive, right? You know what I mean? Why? Because it is so much more than sports. Every person in our room, on our team, is looking for commitment, for trust, right? For love, for unity, connection all those things that rowing brings to us. 
And the way I, you know, the buy-in was getting them to understand those words, that number one thing is in the building. It's so much more than rowing, so much more than urging, so much more than feathering. You guys have proved that. And if we as leaders, as captains, can build the culture based on those words, people stay. That's what, that's what we're able to do. Hey. My question is, how did you come up with the title, The Most Beautiful Thing? Yes, um, good question. Um, I, that was like the hardest part. Um, you know, so in the film, we, in it, we, did, we were filming the, uh, filming the guys as, um, as I was writing this, um, and the moms and um, the, the coaches. And in every interview, individually, Everyone kept saying, this was the most beautiful thing that ever happened to me. The water, it wasn't one thing, and that's why I said a most beautiful thing. It wasn't the most beautiful thing, it was a most beautiful thing. And so even like the guys who knew we were around didn't know nothing about it, well, we were like, these guys just came back beautiful. Like That was what everyone kept saying, and that's why the title was a most beautiful thing. Here. Hi, Arshay. Hey. Um, I absolutely loved your book. I'm a high school teacher and coach, and I've been talking about coming to see you. And um, you have a lot of advice you give in the book, a lot of things on mindset, discipline. If you could go back and tell your 16, 17-year-old self one piece of advice, what would it be? It's a good question to end on. <laughs> um, I will tell my 16-year-old self that you do not have to fight alone. Your anxiety, depression, doubt, fear, don't fight it alone. And I articulated my pain through silence. And um, there's so many young men, um, athletes, that are suffering. And Rowan teaches us that we do not have to fight or worry alone. And, um, and I did that for a, a, a while until uh, I found rowing, so um, you know that's my message to to everyone in here. Whatever you're going through, just man, don't fight alone. Talk to someone about it. Um, you know, no one wants to fight physically fight by themselves. Right? I need help. You know, and so don't do it with uh, with what you're going through. And um, that's that's my message to everybody. Thank you. Uh, we do have someone in the audience we would like to recognize, a special guest, Corey Sanderson, Executive Director of Nashville Rowing, if you wanted to, if you have any remarks for us. Sure. Uh, first, thanks to everybody for coming out. Obviously, uh, this is an awesome opportunity. I've heard Arshay talk formally, informally uh, for years now and, and watched what he's done to be a catalyst for change. Uh, in a lot of places and even today from like the time picking him up at the airport and like driving to the lake, going downtown, eating barbecue and just hanging out and talking and him uh, being a sounding board for what we're doing here. Um, obviously there's a lot of familiar faces in here and, and people I don't know and our hope is to amplify his type of message and show that uh, Nashville is really a city where rowing can take off and not just be a cool thing that some people do, but something that the city can invest in and open a lot of doors. We don't know who the next Arche is going to be and what the next great film, book, play uh, is going to come out of it, but that, you know, whether you're in middle school, high school, college, we've got a lot of the, the Vanderbilt rowers and coaches here. Uh, there's a lot of doors that it can open for you that aren't just gold medals. Those are fun too, but those are a product of a process and, and small steps and achieving goals together. And we're really looking forward to doing that work with a bigger community, uh, more of the city, and continuing to pick Arshay's brain and, and keep bringing him back down here to keep talking to more people um, and put them in rooms like this where, you know, I, just by hearing people and hearing you guys clap and the, the way you're affirming what he's saying, that 
his message is going to leave this room and go to a, an even bigger group. And then the next time he comes, maybe we have an even bigger room and a bigger room. And, and suddenly we've got a whole mass of people uh, ready to get in boats and, and get out on the water and something that I think the city could really benefit from. So thank you guys. We do have some information if you want to grab it at the end, uh, just some flyers and QR codes. We really welcome everybody to come check it out. And if you're really intrepid, there's a regatta next weekend out at the lake. So if you want to come watch uh, some of these kids and adults sitting in the audience, like put this stuff to the test for the first time this spring, then you're always welcome. So uh, thank you, Arshe. Thanks to the library for bringing them down. And uh, we appreciate it. And uh, we're looking forward to the next time already. I have to say just thank you, Corey. Thank you to the library. And, um, and I forgot your name. Not, I see Naya Rowan in high school putting in work in New York since she was young. So it's so good to see you. I remember you just seeing you in the ERG room, putting in work as a young one. Now you're Rowan in college. So good to see you. It's so good to see you. All right. And I'll be here hanging out if you want me to sign your book. Uh, you know, I'll be chilling. Uh, well, thank you, everyone, again, for coming out tonight. Um, Arshe, thank you so much for sharing so um, givingly of yourself um, and your story and, and inspiring us. Um, when we, you know, we got a lot of, we, you get questions. What's this story got to do with, with Nashville? Why, why, why is this here? Um, and one of the things about the work that we do here at the library and especially special collections is those dots. How has our past uh, affected our present and, and what are we doing moving forward? And one of the stories of which um, we are the stewards of in the civil rights room is, is the story of segregation in, in Nashville in the 60s. And we were successful um, in desegregating parts of downtown, lunches, lunch counters, movie theaters. Um, but a lot of people, they come through our space and they say, well, um, it worked. <laughs> uh, segregation's over, racism is over, how do you know, it, it worked. Um, and we always remind them, well, there's a couple of other things that happened after that, and one of them was to desegregate the pools. Um, and that was a mass failure. And if you saw some of, there's a board um, with some of our clippings from the Nashville banner, which we're the home to in that newspaper, um, uh, went under in the 90s. We now own all of um, all of its archival clippings and photographs. And um, it tells a story um, over the period of about three days when all of Nashville's public pools closed um, in the 60s. Um, I know I'm sitting here in the audience with um, family members of someone who tried to integrate that pool um, and he was denied. Um, and it begins a long story, we touched on it a little bit, about the story of um, African Americans in water. Um, and there were no public pools, um, and they were all closed down. And so that is a part of the story that we tell. And so we tell that story about the past, but you know, Arche and what he's doing and the work he's continuing to do and the groups that he's working with, it is that connection. It's, it's, it's why he's, he's here today and why we always like to point that out about where we've come from so that we, we know where we're going and that it still affects people today. Um, so thank you very much for coming. Um, please come back and visit us again if you haven't already been up there to see us. Um, you can talk to me. You can talk to Elliot. You can talk to my colleague over here, Courtney. We are happy to welcome everyone back for scheduled groups. We offer free programs and tours of our spaces, and we will talk about whatever you want. Um, so thank you again. Um, stick around um, if you want to hang out a little bit. Um, and thank you so much for coming out on a Thursday to Nashville Public Library. Thank you. <laughs>